Hello and welcome to Season 5, Episode 2 of the Build a Soil YouTube series. Today is a big day. We're going to be taking cuttings off of our mom plant. So I at least want to go over that process and show you every step of the way what we're doing here for Season 5. If you look, we've got a bed that we're also going to want to bring back to life and we discussed that. So today, we're also going to apply some cover crop in here. I've got some 12 seed cover crop and I've got some root wise and I'm going to mix the two together, sprinkle it on the bed and water it. And I'll show you my process for what to do when there's some mulch, but otherwise it's really simple. At least that's started while we're rooting the clones and then that is going to eventually grow and we'll talk about reamending that bed and we're going to work some of that cover crop back into that top layer what they call green manure. We're basically going to be using it as an actual in-between cycle cover crop. If you don't have time to do this in your cycle, I get it. In fact, we're going to demonstrate another method where um, it sounds like a lot of you want us to start the 4x4 grow tent like right away. No downtime. So because of that, we're not going to grow cover crop in that bed. We're going to get to re-amending right away. And I still think we're going to get a great result out of there because we have cover cropped pretty recently uh, before the last cycle. But it'll give me a chance to highlight two methodologies because I know sometimes you're like, man, I'm ready to go again. How do I grow cover crop in between? You don't have to do it in, in between. You can do it as a living mulch. You can do it as an in-between. You can do it as a companion plant. There's ways to consider the terminology and we'll discuss some of that. Uh, but most importantly, we're gonna take some clones. I've also got the seeds still germinating. It's not been too long since we popped the seeds, but I will give you an update. We've got seven so far that are looking pretty good. We've got one more that decided to pop this morning and is kind of looking a little bit weak. So we'll see if it stands up for me or not. And the other three we're still waiting for. Now. Sometimes there's a difference in the time the seeds germinate, and that's fine. One last thing to consider is we've done the DNA testing before. I think we're just going to do it pretty straightforward, but if you guys really want to see the DNA testing, we can consider doing it, and then maybe just do the old school way as well and compare those results. Might be kind of fun to do. Otherwise, I'm just going to focus on taking the clones today. We'll let these seeds grow up a little bit. We'll see the final number as far as germination. Um, this was a number one pack that was from the first round of the breeding and then I've just kept in my office. It wasn't stored perfectly, so I'm not gonna be like, oh no, we didn't get 100% germination, it's the breeder's fault. I've germinated lots of packs. Sometimes I get 100%, sometimes I don't. Don't be worried about it if that happens to you. We just wanna make sure that we pick the healthiest, most vibrant ones that we connect to to grow in our next run and hopefully we can narrow it down. Now, when we're talking about pheno hunting or geno hunting or whatever you wanna call it, that could be going through thousands and thousands of seeds of the same variety to look for something unique. It could be going through one 10 pack to see what you find that's unique. And so don't let anybody you know, tell you that you can't do that on small scale. But I think any of us that are running like 10 seeds and looking for a keeper, we wish we could pop thousands of seeds and pick the best one. Because I think we all agree, when you look at hundreds or thousands of something, there seems to be statistical outliers, not just the average, right? And so when we're looking for that keeper, we're looking for that statistical outlier in a good way. And over the last... I mean, just nine or 10 years of documenting just for build a soil grows on Instagram and then YouTube. We found some great cuts, but I think part of that is just because we know what we like. We narrow that down by seeking seeds that are likely to produce that and we have a blast with it. So it's up to you, but every once in a while you'll hear about this elite clone that's going around and every year there seems to be some new favorite, whether it washes well or whether it's just grown for the best flower. And there's something different. It's up to you as far as I keep saying that, but. Do you wanna go look for that one or do you wanna go look for your own? And I think I always find it more exciting to pop seeds and look for my own. I've run several elite cuts that have been gifted over the years and they've been incredible. I think one of the first elite cuts that I grew that was outside of what I was growing for myself was uh, Gorilla Glue, some bubble gum, some other cuts that were just like in the beginning for me that I was able to get my hands on. After years of growing, I was like, wow, I can tell why these are elite. They're just really something special. But now that there's more seeds available, we're not just buying online overseas and kind of the luck of the draw, I feel like it's gotten a lot better. And so over these last four seasons here, as far as the YouTube series, either we've gotten really lucky or the breeders are just great because I've liked a lot of what we've grown. And I expect you, if you grow the build a soil way, you choose good seeds, I think you're gonna like a lot. You're gonna like a lot of what you grow as well. So let's get started. I need to move a few things around. I'm gonna set up my base and then I'm gonna talk about how I'm gonna cut clones. And then we'll show you the mom plant and talk about that. And we're just gonna start putting some together so that for one, I have enough to put in these two quadrants, which we'll discuss. I mentioned in, in the first episode what we're gonna do. 
Um, and then beyond that, I want to give away a whole bunch because I don't want to just kill the mom plant for no reason. And we're not going to kill the mom plant today, although I don't have space to keep a mom here. We're going to keep it just in case we completely fail at rooting the clones. It's never happened, but God forbid something really bad happens and I screw up royally. I'd like to have the mom plant around. And now that we're getting into our fifth season, you know, each time we have one little issue here or there, I've heard even a few people say, man, I wish there was more problems so we could be educated on that. I'm trying not to create my own problems. I'm trying to lead by example and show you that if you do follow good principles, you shouldn't have very many problems. It's fun to highlight them when they occur, but to be honest, I'm a little embarrassed. I want the system to work so you can borrow from our confidence and know that you're gonna to get to your really successful harvest for yourself. And talking about seeds and germ rates, it's funny because I just popped some more Kid Kaya seeds at home and actually some more from Covert. He sent me a gift pack and he sent me a whole bunch of his more recent packs because I bought some a while ago and I've just been popping what I have. I was excited to, to germinate some and what the sequence of events was right around 420, our Discord group from the Patreon, they all wanted to do a 420 grow off and there's some prizes. They created it all on their own. I'm so excited to see it all take shape. And so I really wanted to participate. And so I went and popped the two giveaway packs that we give, gave away as part of the Patreon. I never thought we'd do something like that, but Kid Kaya stepped up and he did like hundreds and hundreds of packs. And there were little three packs and there was two varieties that you could have got. And he gave me both of those. So I popped two of those three packs and one three pack of Covert and I just gotten all of them pretty recently and I stored them properly and I put them in a year old 3.0 soil that I'd taken home. It was in my garage. I put them in two gallon pots and I popped them on 420 and then I popped the Covert ones I think the next day because they came in the mail like the next day and I was like, oh, what's three more? And we got 100% germination using 3.0 soil to germinate. So I really feel like if you're at home and you're like, I don't have the exact soil or what am I doing? Just pop the seeds and let's get, let's get going. I've used 3.0, I've used light, I've used our seedling soil. I really designed the seedling soil to be for smaller trays when you're popping lots of seeds for vegetables and things like that. I personally prefer to use our Build-A-Soil light for popping seeds, but this works really well too and I'm trying to highlight all of our different products. Let's get to cutting clones. Let's get to taking cuts and then rooting them into clones. I don't wanna drop the seeds or anything, so I'll slide. back there out of the way. I've got my dome here. This we've used for a long time. I've just had it, had some stickers, so I always know it's the same one. This one right here, I'd like to have taken home and run through the dishwasher. I scrubbed it, but it just could use a little bit better. And here in the sink at work, I just don't have the tools to do it. So I'm hoping it doesn't present any issues, but it looks pretty clean to me. And I cleaned the tray. I cleaned the dome. So we're ready to go. And then I got a brand new bag of the Floraflex incubator plugs and We've used lots of varieties. The reason that we use the Floraflex brand is one, they're a great company to deal with, but secondarily, we've noticed that there's a particular glue. We've been told that it's made from a formaldehyde type process and that they don't include it in the ingredients on a lot of these brands. But for whatever reason, if you've used all the rooting pucks out there, you'll know that they don't break down. Like you'll go in the backyard from like two years ago, or two years ago, two years ago, growing, and you'll like be digging in the garden, you'll find an old root puck. And you're like, how is it still there? Like, how is it even possible? I thought these were peat moss. Where these ones, I'm happy to report, do break down. And they don't have that same binder. It's a little bit different. And so this bag was a little bit dry when I opened it. And so what I did is I like to bring it back to moisture. I actually filled it with water. You can see it's full right now. And when I'm done, I'm just gonna drain that water back out and put it on my shelf. But looking at the size of this mom, I don't even think this is gonna be enough. So probably what I'm gonna do is either go through the whole pack or not, but I'm gonna just be putting cuttings in, soaking in some aloe, and then switching to plain water and probably just give cuts away uh, to anybody that wants them. We don't sell anything like that, but it's really fun to share. And when you become a gardener or a grower, you become a producer, not just a consumer. And that means you have lots of gifts to share all the time, whether it's food from your garden or cuts from your plants. But my rule is I don't like to take cuts. It can be awkward sometimes because you wanna give them away, but <laughs> when people offer you clones, you're like, nah, it's all good. I don't take any clones. And I think it's a really good rule because it's easy to get problems. In fact, in the 10 by 10, the tropical tent, we've been buying some plants and I'm really nervous that some of those problems might migrate. So I'm really starting to take notice over there and make sure that we keep everything really clean. So if you've got a million house plants, things like that, right? Like me, I've got lots of animals. You wanna keep up on that IPM and make sure that you're keeping things as clean as possible. But I'm gonna use these. We already talked about why we like this brand. They break down. Um, we've got this huge mom plant and I just wanna talk about that real quick. This mom plant, it wasn't really planned to get it this big. But when we started growing it, 
it was clear that it was a fast grower. I really, I believe that healthy mom leads to healthy cuts, leads to good rooting, and then healthy clones. And so to me, if you're really restricting that root space, that means you need to be more diligent and you need to be up on feeding and that becomes more hydro-like. And then I also think lower light and then timing when you wanna take cuts by ramping it up into explosive growth. So when you take the cuts, it's almost like they're trying to grow right when you take them as opposed to something that's winding down or been lingering. And so if you've got a plant, to me the worst time to clone is when you feel like, oh no, I've messed up. I'm gonna try and save this plant by cloning it. To me, you're really nursing it to peak health before you take cuttings. The other reason I think that's important is because you've heard probably on the forums or maybe from friends that if you have a mom plant, you wanna keep the same mom forever. You don't wanna take a clone, make that a mom, take a clone from a clone from a clone from a clone because as the story goes, the DNA is gonna decline over time or you're gonna get something that's not the same as the mom you used to have. While there is some truth to that, I really believe that the minuscule amount that we would notice from healthy plants changing is, is negligible. And so to me, when they really do turn up different, there's new findings. Could have been disease, right? Lots of things happen. But to me, when you keep a mom forever and it's not at peak health, that's worse. I would rather take a clone from a clone from a clone. And as long as it's always in peak health when, it's, when you take the cut, I feel like you're a lot more likely to keep its true genetic lineage around than keeping an unhealthy mom around just forever. So that's my two cents, take it for what it's worth. This is in a, let's discuss down here. So this is in the Auto XXL. So this is a preview of how big it's gonna be. I've got some black lava rock on top, super low maintenance mulch. Didn't do any cover crop this time. I'm very busy this time of year, so we don't want anything to deal with. I do have an EcoWhip moisture meter in here, and this is a display. I don't often use this, but I'm finding it nice in here when I just peek because it's a visual. So you can see right now in the top layer, it's 31% moisture. It's probably a little bit moisture deeper down. So I'm using that more as a guideline to when this top portion is drying out. But these auto pot bags breathe all the way. They're not like the living soil ones that we normally use that have the plastic liner. So it will be drying out in this zone. And either way, it's really helped me keep it this healthy. And this is a mixture. I had some open bags lying around. This was build a soil light and ultra clean recipe just mixed together. The ultra clean has lots of drainage. It's really easy to water often without worrying about it. And so that was kind of the thought behind there. I'm just able to kind of let this pump. I fed it organic gem once or twice just to make sure that it's really pushing before we go to take cuts. And I feel like for as big as it is, it's a really healthy mom. I've moved it into a quadrant where there's no light right now just for filming, but it was up front underneath the Magnolia LED. And I think that's why it was you know, doing so well. And it had a little bit of side lighting from that one. Other thing I've noticed is there's a little bit of white on here. And so we've switched out our humidifier. I was being pretty lazy while we were in between cycles and I was just using our filtered water from the hose to fill up my humidifier reservoir. And as soon as I fired up the mom plant and I wanted to put it in here, I was like, oh man, I'm gonna have to get humidity going, everything. So that needs to be scrubbed down before we start this next cycle. And I've switched over to RO water. Only reason I didn't do it regularly is the water's far away from where we're doing it. And I probably need to set up a float valve, something like that this season, because doing five gallons a time on a really small RO takes like the whole day. And then if I forget to, I don't fill it. Then I grab the hose and it's a bad cycle because the amount of white film that comes from the water that we get out of our tap here is ridiculous. And when you see it, you're like, I don't want that on my plants. It's lowering the sheen and then it's not receiving the light as well. So that's one thing that will change. Otherwise, I think she's immaculate. Looks really, really good, very healthy. So we're gonna take cuts off this one. And because it's such a big, healthy mom, I really get to pick the cream of the crop. I've got so many good cuts on here for me to select. We're gonna have four in this quadrant. Why don't I go over that real quick before I take the cuts and then we can wrap it up by just getting this all done. So this quadrant, we're gonna be running an auto pot XXL, that size right there. This is not hooked up to an auto pot. I've been top watering but I'm using the container and tray. We're gonna put that over here in this quadrant and then I'm going to have an earth box and we're also gonna do a blue mat and we're gonna match the soil volume. So I'm gonna actually match the exact volume of that as close as I can and put the same amount of soil into probably like a 20 gallon uh, fabric pot and make sure that we're considering matching soil volume for an automated top irrigation versus an automated bottom irrigation and I'm not doing a head to head, I'm doing more of like a comparison because we've got three things going on, but all of them are automatic watering. And I think it's gonna be really, really fun. I love earth boxes, you know it. This bigger auto pot clearly throws down. So I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have a really good time with that. I'm hoping we just don't blow up the section too big. And part of that's gonna be timing. So we're trying to dial that. And then we're also gonna do, like I said, a regular fabric pot. 
with the blue mats in there done exactly to their specifications. The other reason I'm excited is we're going to be comparing EcoWit to blue mat as far as those are two completely different types of moisture readings. And from what I understand from the manufacturer, from the sales guy that I've been dealing with that works with blue mat, he mentioned that we can get a graph made and we can basically accurately predict depending on your soil texture. So if it's more clay like or more sand like, depending on how you mix your recipe, we can actually use the EcoWit and we can use the blue mat and we can create the perfect zone for calibration so we know exactly what we're looking at. So that's gonna be really fun. So this back quadrant, I mentioned it in the first episode, but we're gonna have four plants there, all the same from this mom, as close as we can match in size. And we're gonna run a 30 gallon, a 15 gallon, a seven gallon, and a five gallon. And the, the main reason is the number one mistake we see new growers coming to the living soil style, the build a soil way, if you will, they'll choose too small of a container size for a number of reasons, right? One is you gotta buy more soil. Um, but you can keep it forever and we're not really trying to upsell the soil volume. What I don't understand is when someone says I don't have enough room and I'm, we're talking about a four by four area regardless, right? A lot of times I get it if you're in a really small tent. And so a lot of times it takes two or three runs and people start to migrate up. And I've just noticed an old article that Coot turned me on to a long time ago. He mentioned that the root size, when you, when you double the container size, you get like a 40% increase in yield. So it's not exactly one to one, but it's like, for me, it, it is a cornerstone of the Build-A-Soil way because it makes everything easier. You don't have to be a pro. You have new roots going through new soil, getting access to fresh nutrients, and it just makes it much, much better. And that's where you're depending on the soil and you're being a good steward as opposed to trying to be a, like a hydroponic grower. So that's what we're gonna display in that back, back section. And I've talked enough, so let's get going. I've got my water here. I've just got some random cups from the back that'll allow me to just soak them. What I like to do is put some aloe in there and I know that in here it has regular directions for like a teaspoon per gallon. But what I'm gonna do is go a little bit harder than that. Not quite a teaspoon in here, but I'm just gonna sprinkle a small amount. Probably say quarter teaspoon in each one. And it's pretty humid in here. So as soon as I'm done, I'm gonna close this bag up, make sure I don't get moisture in it. I'll just use my scissors and give it a stir. And this is what I'm gonna soak the cuttings in so that as soon as they're cut, I want them to drink a little bit of water and they're gonna drink in this, giving them a little bit of energy, a little bit of hormones, all the, all the benefits of that aloe vera plant. And they're gonna soak that up. Now, sometimes I'll leave that for up to 24 hours and then I'll change it out to plain water. And then when I have time, I'll start putting them in pucks. But at least while I'm cutting them today, I'm just gonna soak them in this cup uh, with that aloe so they drink a little bit of it. And that'll be all I do for rooting. We don't use any rooting hormones. If you've got an aloe plant at home, a lot of people will cut a fresh leaf off of aloe vera. The only aloe vera is the Barbadensis miller. It's the one we use for this. All the other aloe varieties are not the vera. And it seems like the vera has a lot of beneficial properties, but they will literally just poke holes in a fresh leaf and like put their clones right in it. You can puree some of the inner filet and make your own aloe. You can buy it from us. This is freeze dried, so it's, it's harvested fresh and it's grown near the equator. So you get all the medicinal properties and then it's immediately available because it's been freeze dried, just like the best head stash you know, freeze dried rosin. We're trying to preserve all that when we use a plant material. So let's pick some good ones. I see a top one here I wanna take. Let me go to the back. And so this one could actually be a cutting. What I'm looking for is I want there to be at least one node here where roots can grow out. But since there's none lower here and I've got so many, I'm just gonna discard this one. I'll just make my mess over here and discard this one and this one. I like to clean them up quite a bit. now. If we're doing the entire bag and I've got to have them really tight together in here, right? Height is a concern. So I don't want it to be taller than my dome because I'd like to put a dome on. Now I have a humidifier. I can keep it really high humidity in here. I may just do that, but most of the time we don't have that control and a dome is a great way to go. So I'm going to keep the height in mind. The other thing is I can leave these leaves on, but you see most facilities will cut these down because if we crowd them together, it's going to be moisture building up on there and it's area for bacteria to grow. So what I like to do is I'll just show you is I actually clean this up all the way down to just this area. And then from here, since we're gonna be crowding them, I actually like to come through and cut some of the leaves off so it's occupying a smaller space. I don't think that part is, is necessary. In fact, you can get really healthy growth with the whole leaf on there, but I'm just giving you the reasons why these things are often done. So you don't just copying them blindly. You don't have to trim the edges of the leaf off. In fact, when the clone is rooted, I mean, I know people that leave more of the material on. They like to have kind of a big plant when it's finally rooted. These are all preferences and you'll learn what works best for you. I just like to clean it up, especially when I'm doing a whole bunch. 
I'm not gonna clean up every one of them, uh, but normally I do this, and then as I go do it, I'll pick the height so that it doesn't go in the dome improperly and I get a fresh cut. But right now, I'm just gonna drop it in here so I can bank a whole bunch of them, and then I'll go grab some and I'll actually put them in the puck before we're done today so I can show you that. I'm not gonna do them all, I wanna soak some of them, and I'm probably gonna get a couple trays. I'm gonna do one tray just for my cuts, I'm gonna do another tray with all the others that's a little more crowded, and then that way I can check back on the roots, and then some of my friends will get some rooted cuts instead of just some straight cuts off the plant, which a lot of times they don't have a setup to, to grow the roots on their own, and your friends might be worried. And since we wanna get them started on the hobby, we wanna turn them into growers, so they got some fire to share sometimes, it's fun to give it away. So it's part of the process. Let me just get going now, now that we've basically discussed everything that I wanna do. I'll leave that one. Now, when I go to pocket, I will take some of that off. I don't like to leave these because they'll get moist and grow bacteria on them and start to mold up in your dome, depending on how much moisture you have. So I'll actually clean that up. The other thing that people do is when they clean it up, sometimes they'll strip the stalk. Other people say never strip the stalk because it can lead to problems, right? Totally up to you. The idea is that this thick layer here is a lot harsher or thicker and stronger. And so it's harder for the roots to grow through. But I also feel if we're leaving a node here, right where that was, the roots can grow out of that. I don't like to strip the whole stock completely. Sometimes I'll give it one little strip. I've talked about it, I've done it, I've done both ways. I feel like they all work. Most importantly, we just wanna leave one of these open, in my opinion, helps a lot, than just a straight stock. And so if I was to just put this into the rooting puck, I would feel better cutting it a little bit shorter and putting that right in the middle of my rooting puck. So you have that to be the first place where roots will likely come out. And I've also used the cloning machines and it's kind of cool because you can see right when the roots strike. And a lot of times you will see them come out of there first or on like a wound on the end. So it really just depends, but it's cool to see that. So maybe we've done the same way. Maybe one of the next seasons we'll actually bring a cloning machine in to show you how we transplant from bare roots in a living soil versus something that already has a puck. Drop in a comment. You're watching us do our way, right? And I feel like as long as you get roots and it's healthy, then, then, then it's a good method. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you do it. Do you like to use a cloning machine? Do you like to use pucks? What's your style? You can even, just so you know, you can leave just, I change the water out daily, put it on the kitchen counter, and in about 15 days, you'll have roots striking on a couple of them. Not as vigorous as when you do the job properly, but sometimes if you don't have space and you really wanna try and keep a plant, just take a few clones and put it on the kitchen counter. Change the water every day and see if you get lucky. It's really fun to do, just like house plants. I'm just gonna pick like all the best ones right now for me. So... They're all so good that literally I don't even have to pick. But I'm just taking, I guess, like the top side ones and all the ones that look really happy. And I'm gonna take double the amount that I need just to make sure. So the color on this one looks pretty good. This genetic has a lot of color in it. It does have a little bit of purpling, but I, I feel like this is mostly the genetics. It's a pretty big plant, it's kind of overgrown, but the green looks really healthy to me. When we, right before we transplanted, um, the stem was a little bit hard and purple was a little bit darker than this and that was not making me happy That's part of why I transplanted and so I really do feel like the texture everything that we're looking for is there it feels like rubbery Strong really lots of odor man. That's loud. This is the fruit by the funk number three that we kept and it is just loud even in veg Wow, I want to get 14, you know, really good choices for myself and then the rest is gonna go I'm just gonna take a whole bunch to give away and, you know, when I first started this and we were going to run from clone, I was like, well, gosh, I want to make sure I have a whole bunch of good size ones. So I should grow a bigger mom this time so that I'm not like choosing two or three big clones and one or two small ones. Right. I want to make sure I have really good choice. So some people swear that the side branches have more hormones. I've not really found that to be true. But between like the lowers here, these ones actually look really healthy surprised it's crazy compared to the tops they're a little bit curved so a lot of times i'll just go for the top but honestly they fix themselves right away and sometimes when you have a plant that's not as healthy the lowers will be kind of scraggly that's why i picked the top ones but man this looks really good i'm actually happy with that i'm gonna use this one so those are the 14 that i'm going to use and that way i'm hoping to get seven really good rooted ones so i always like to double the amount that i require then if some of them take a little longer to root, I've probably got my preference already up front rooted first. 
I've noticed that I don't always get 100%, but when I do, even when I do get 100%, some of them root faster than the others. It's part of that hormonal difference in the plant. So I take more. I have an abundant mindset. I encourage you to do the same thing. You got big soil, big mom plant. You get plenty of cuts. You should have no worries keeping what you actually need for your next cycle. And if that's not the case, then obviously you can pop more seeds. But it's amazing what one mom plant can do. I'm looking at this and looking at hundreds of more cuts on there. And I don't have time to record me taking them all today, but essentially I'm just gonna put them in water and start giving them away. And then tomorrow when I have time, I'll take some of the ones out of water and I'll puck up some more. That way I have some rooted, like I mentioned. Um, but this is most important what I wanted to get done today. So let's, let's puck a couple of these up so we finish the process. Let's get to it. So I'm just gonna choose one, okay? And I want it to be probably like this tall and I wanna pick a node. So I can go all the way up to this one or I can go all the way down to this one. So I'm gonna choose this one and I'm gonna have that at the top of my rooting puck and I'm gonna go down a little bit for some, for some height. So I'm gonna cut, I don't think it matters, but I always cut like at an angle. I honestly don't think it matters. <laughs> and then this, I don't want on, I didn't really mean to strip it, but I just wanna get that off. I don't want that little bit there. That's about it. Now here, what I'd like to do is trim that little bit off so that it's not getting rotten, those little hairs. That's about it. Okay, take my plug. Now it's just soaking in water in here. And so it's dripping. I'm not gonna squeeze it, but I'm gonna just shake some of the water off and that's it. Put that in and so I've got that touching there so it can root right out of that node. I didn't really burst through the bottom and that should be good and I've got plenty of space so I don't need to be too particular about where I put them in here. There we go, there's the first one. Fruit by the funk. Okay, you can see all the saponins from the aloe. We talk about saponin a lot. We have the Q, the yucca, but aloe has it. Alfalfa has it. A lot of plants use it for many different reasons, so. Looks great. Like I said, I'm not like trying to strip the whole the whole thing, but since I like to peel this one off, it creates it. So I guess is what best of both worlds you can call it. We have a tutorial, like a blog article on how to take cuttings and the basics of rooting any cutting. There's hardwood and then there's you know more like plants like this like the annuals and softer and so there's some different tech but essentially we need to keep the humidity high and we, we don't want to have really bright light and there's a couple of basics that give you a lot better success and I've seen a lot of people put a really bright light like we're gonna dim this a lot or I'll move it out of this area but that causes them to want to grow and so just while I'm thinking and doing this I want you to know that I don't want them to grow I want them to grow roots so when I keep them nice and humid that means there's no pressure for them to try and move water through their roots and up. They don't have any, so they can't. So if I kept it dry in here, they would wilt. If I moved them from a humid environment to a dry environment, they would wilt. Right now I'm fine leaving them kind of hanging out with the dome off because it's very humid in here. But if you're working in a dry environment, you wanna put the dome right back on because they can start to wilt pretty quickly when the humidity is low. It puts pressure on the plant. And then that, that intense light. I'm leaving it on because we're filming. I've got my glasses on, the lights are really bright but I'm going to dim it a little bit. And so that's important too. You can research that blog article at Build a Soil. It'll give you some of those tips, but essentially it's just that, let's baby them. We wanna keep the humidity very high. That way there's no pressure on the plant. We don't need lots of light for them to root. So that's kind of my main tips. I'm just spacing them out randomly until I get to the end. Then I'll just make sure there's even airflow through all of them, make my life really easy in here. It's easier to um, root them when you don't have a hundred of them going because when it gets crowded, it's just harder to keep things healthy, just airflow wise and trying to get them to root. I feel like it's better when there's a little bit more space in there. It makes it easier. Let me see. Will that be good? Too tall? What am I working with here? It's cutting a little close, but I think that's good. I'm good with it. I just don't want to go any taller than I currently am on any of them. I feel like they're pretty good. There's a couple that are close to each other, but they're leaning opposite directions. There's plenty of space in there. I wanna get this dome on, so I'm gonna call it a day and just get it done. And then what I'm gonna do is close these. 
You don't have to do that, but at home, you probably have a lot less humidity than I do, and so you wanna keep it humid. Shift that over there, and then I can start to open it. I'm not really too worried about that. We can talk about like how I open them. Not too much method to my madness when it comes to that. I will kind of inspect if it's getting too much moisture buildup in here. Every single day, I'd like to come just do a fresh release, make sure there's some fresh air brought in there so it's not getting stale. And so pretty quickly, I will open these, but I just wanna see that they're taking and that they're happy. So I'm gonna leave that. As I mentioned, I don't like them to be in the brightest light, but I think they'll be fine for the rest of what we're doing here today, and then I'll dim it. I'm gonna take a whole bunch more. I'm gonna put in these cups and let them soak overnight, and then I'm gonna puck up a whole bunch more to give away. And if, in case I make a mistake over here, at least I'll have backups on backups on backups. I'll seal these up for now so they stay nice and moist. I don't spill them or something like that. And then I'm gonna go on to the next step. So for me, I'd like to put some cover crop down. I've got our 12 seed cover crop and I've got Rootwise Microbe Complete. The Microbe Complete is the one that has the mycorrhizae in there, the mycorrhizal fungi, and that's gonna help connect to the root system. Now, there's different types of mycorrhizae out there. There's some that go around the root and there's some that go in the root. There's the endo versus the ecto. The gardening blends will have both. And most of the companies that sold to us endo or growers, they would just sell you the blend of both because they bought it from another company and then they'd put a cool label on it. Rootwise really designed this for what we're looking for to be like the creme de la creme, better than anything they offered, even at the manufacturer, and selected by him. And obviously part of that is the correct mycorrhizal fungi. And that's why we use the Rootwise, many other reasons. But when we first started, we carried, we still do, our own mycorrhizal inoculum. Certain number of spores per gram, and it was just that. But eventually, Kevin came around, and this is what I'm looking for. It's more of the permaculture way. We have diversity. Everything from a healthy farm is on here. Normally you'll see these videos and guys will be like, make sure you have your mycos, make sure you get your azos, make sure you get your, you know, your PNSB. And those might just sound like acronyms, but they're individual types of microorganisms that growers have found super useful. And those are in a balanced quorum in here, meaning like if you put too much of one biology versus the other, they can cannibalize each other. And so this is, actually has some intelligence put into it. And the way that I like to use it is that a seed inoculum directly to the seed when I'm doing this because I've just got the filtered garden hose, it'll be easier than me mixing a couple of cans because this will need a, quite a bit of moisture. So here's what I'm gonna do. Just like I did the seeds that we germinated. I'm gonna take the cover crop. I've already used some of this. I'm gonna go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of Rootwise in there. Just enough to coat the seeds and so it's gonna be like, I don't know, half a tablespoon. Then I'm gonna take this. Now the seed's completely coated. When you're doing it in a big seed box on the back of a tractor, they actually use like a talc or a graphite, some sort of powder to kind of lubricate the seeds that flow out in an even order out of the seed machine. And so it's a pretty common practice to put your inoculum directly with the seeds. A lot of times growers though, we put it right in the hole, but I'm doing a whole bunch. So this is an easier way for me to go. This is gonna get cleared out of here. A lot of times I would leave this down, but I'm gonna be growing my own and I don't wanna stifle the germination of all these seeds by some heavy matting. And so I'm just gonna clean up because I don't have a bucket right here. I'm gonna set it down right now so I can just keep filming. I have been watering this slowly, so it's coming you know, back to life. There was moisture in the middle. A lot of guys are like, man, can you get any dry down? Would that be a problem? Well, I wanted to clean out the flood trays that we had in here and just make it nicer and clean the floors. So we did that. I got a little bit of dry down, but it was still heavy and there's worms and it was still moist down in the center. So we're just kind of bringing that moisture back up. I wanna make sure that we use a wetting agent. We bring this back slowly. The first step for me, besides all of the bringing the moisture mac back, which we've already done, is getting the cover crop going. That really makes it a living bed. We mentioned we're gonna teach two ways. One is where we're doing it as a cover crop between cycles. Another where we don't do the cover crop, but we probably do it as a living mulch. And so I wanna spread the seed, but first what I'd like to do is I'd like to get good seed contact with the soil. And so I'm just gonna kinda of go around and wiggle this just a little bit to break up any like hard pan areas. It looks like some gnarly barley from last time, some matted cover crop. And I'm not really tilling, I'm just working it into a flatter area. Now I have a big stock here. I have to decide, I, yep, I'm just gonna, look at that, it just fell apart, that's awesome. It's been de decomposing in there. Look at, huge stock system from the last grow. And so I like to leave as much of this in there as possible. I'm gonna be growing in similar locations. I could just plant next to it, but this one just kinda wiggled so loose. Wow, that's thick, it grew trees in here last time. Fruit by the funk. And I'm just gonna discard this so it's not in the way. I'm gonna keep going around. I'm gonna try and leave these. We can always pull them out later, whatever, because we're gonna be re-amending this bed and working some of the cover crop in as like a green manure. And so if you've ever planted like seeds at your house or anything like that on a broad scale, you need to have the seed touch the soil. That's where you get the moisture contact. 
And so if I just throw it right on top of the mulch, it may not be perfect. And I don't want the seeds to go down the corners. So I'm kind of opening up the soil, pushing it against the corners there. Just really get my hands in there, that's, that's it. What I'm gonna do is take these inoculated seeds, put them in my hand and sprinkle them around. Now, realistically, when you go like per acre, it's like five pounds an acre of clover to get good cover crop stand. I wanna go kind of intense because I'm not gonna let it get very big. I'm gonna work it in. And all this is seed meal. I mean, we feed our soil with ground up seeds. Karanja seed, neem cake seed, and soybean seed, and all those are beans, seeds, whatever you wanna call them, depending on the application. That's what feeds the soil in a natural way. So this is another fertilizer, so to speak. So all I'm doing is sprinkling them. No real rhyme or reason other than I kind of want to, I want to try and get even coverage. So I'm going to go around the perimeter first, like I'm building the puzzle. Get all the way to the edge. Now I'm going to go through the middle. That's probably good, but since I got more, might as well just use the whole bag on here. We're just gonna feed it right, right back. All this is gonna go back to the soil anyways. We're just gonna convert some of what's in here through plants and then feed it right back. Get the last of that root wise going. There we go. That wasn't a full bag. That was only a half pound. And it was probably a half a bag in there. So I, let's say I put a quarter pound in here. That's a lot if you compare it to like per acreage. So we're going really hard on it. Don't have to do that, but we're looking for quick results, good stand. Now the last thing I wanna do is just wiggle the seed so it actually falls through this mulch, touches the soil. That's it. Then I'm gonna grab my hose that I have set to the side here and I'm gonna moisten it. That way there's actual moisture right here in the zone. I can kind of sprinkle this back over since I've moved it around a little bit, cover it up a little bit. I like to put the mulch over here to protect all these seeds, keep them kind of shaded keep them moist after I hit the hose up in here. Make it easy. It goes through a big boy garden filter. So this is filtered for chlorine and sediment and other things. It's not RO because RO has some waste. There's not as much pressure. I really just like using a filter. This is a big boy. The tall boy is kind of slow on pressure. A lot of people will just use that to fill up a reservoir and then use a pump if they're actually gonna wanna use it. Most of the time I fill up the chapin, but when things get going crazy, I like to have a filtered hose that makes a big difference. And you can see the big boy's got pretty good pressure. I'm gonna try and just evenly hit the surface, but because this soil's not soaking wet, I'm trying not to get it to run down the edges there all the way onto the floor, but whatever. I can always mop in here later, and we're not even really growing yet, so it's all good. I'm going around the edges, just like I did with the cover crop seed. Now I'm gonna go through the middle. Who knows, if we like the blue mats this time, maybe we'll put them in the bed for season six but I think we're just gonna show off this quadrant because it's the biggest amount of soil. We're gonna show off the total build a soil way where we do hand water and follow the feeding schedule, basically none, almost just water only. In fact, I think that's what we decided to do, basically just water only after I do the reamending. That way I can show you that you don't have to spend money. A little reamend and you can get an entire grow, especially when you have lots of soil, it makes a huge, huge difference. So I know about how quickly the water comes out of here. You can always test it with a five gallon bucket for a minute or two and see how long it takes to fill. Then you kind of understand how much water you're putting down. But the moisture meters, lots of ways to do this. For right now, I'm giving it less than it needs. And I'm just gonna come back later and hit it up again. My main concern was just making sure that cover crop and that top layer was nice and moist. That's it. We had some success already. We've had some mistakes already. Not all the seeds have germinated, but I did see one popping today. Sometimes there's some stagger there. If you think about nature, if all of its seeds germinate the same day and there's a horrible storm the next day, well, it's been wiped out. A lot of times you'll see di uh, differences in the seed hole thickness, how long it takes to germinate, the seed size. I try never rely on having 100% success, especially in the garden. I just feel like it's a bad plan. But in here on YouTube, I want to have 100% success and I'm sure you can understand that. But it is what it is. Um, I will report back on more seeds. We've got thousands of seeds in here that are gonna germinate. We'll show you as, as that progress grows. And then next, what I'd like to do is we're gonna to go to the four x four tent and we're gonna do another episode on how to amend that without doing the cover crop first because um, basically I've heard that you guys just wanna get that going. And so I need to reach out to Daz. I need to make sure that we choose the right seeds, get them coming, and we're gonna discuss how we're gonna directly transplant into that bed. If there's too much life, should we directly transplant? Should we do a cup first? 
So we have a few decisions to make. That's gonna be fun. But either way, I wanna do a really good job on the auto flower. This Fruit by the Funk, Covert Genetics, your seeds are incredible. Thank you for the kind gifts. This mom plant is epic. If you're in the area, you wanna cut, I can just take a cut off there. We're gonna have extras here. And that's it, that's a wrap. Thank you so much, season five, episode two. As always, subscribe, like, tell your friends about this series. It'll help them grow so that you can have them having some fresh herbs sometimes. We also are gonna be documenting um, the world record pumpkin at least a little bit as it starts to get bigger. We're gonna do some random episodes on the tropical 10 by 10. So if you like this stuff, tap in, hit the subscribe, hit the like button. It really helps us with the algorithm. And until next time, I'll see you guys on the next Build a Soil YouTube episode.